Hi, I'm Jamie. This is Dead Dodge Garage, and this is a Magnum engine. Since the very beginning of Dead Dodge Garage, I've been planning to do a video guide explaining how to make one of these Magnum engines run in your classic Chrysler vehicle. For various reasons, it hasn't exactly worked out that way. In fact, my original plan was to do a complete beginning to end Magnum swap. Show you that process as well as the wiring and fuel system ends of things. Since that time, I have been promising to rectify this situation. And especially in the last several weeks, Dead Dodge Garage World Headquarters has been literally inundated with three people asking about it. I guess it's finally time to talk Magnum wiring. I want to make a point to say I'm going to tell you what electrical connections you need to make in this video, but I'm not really going to tell you how to make them. If you don't have a basic understanding of DC electrical systems and crimping and heat shrinking and, you know, good ways to connect wires to other wires or terminals, you probably shouldn't attempt this. If you're a true beginner, you might want to watch some intro to DC wiring stuff and practice before you try and make an entire EFI swap run in your classic Chrysler product. Just saying. Otherwise, you end up with a horrible mess like this. I mean, sometimes even when you know what you're doing, you end up with a horrible mess like this, but that's another story altogether. Now, before we dive into the wire nuts and butt splices of this swap, I want to talk donors. This is my favorite. It's a 2001 Ram 1500. This is a 4x4, but it really doesn't matter. It's an automatic truck, and being newer than 97, it has electronic transmission control built into this module. It will be mad if you don't use that transmission, but it will work. Here's why the RAM is the best. All of the wiring from the PCM is self-contained in this harness. It splits off to go to different sections of the engine and the transmission, if so equipped. But one section continues from there and terminates here in that plug in the power distribution center. Because of that, all you have to do to remove your donor harness from the truck side of things is loosen one 10 millimeter bolt. This is a 98 Dodge Durango. And it's also a suitable donor, sort of. The oil pan is slightly different for reasons. But other than that, the engine itself is exactly the same. No problems there. The problem is the wiring harness from the computer on this vehicle is actually integrated into the truck harness. Lighting, that sort of thing is all wrapped into it. You don't get the one big plug to unhook to bring all that with. You have to take the whole thing, including the box. Now, in some cases, that might be what you want. I mean, for one thing, you could upgrade your headlights and other parts of your vehicle to being powered by relays, which can be a good thing. But you're going to get a lot of things you don't want, and it may be a bigger headache than you really need in life. As a quick aside, the Dakota pickup and the Jeep Grand Cherokee with these V8 engines are also the same as the Durango. Any of those are going to have the engine harness wrapped in with lighting and everything else. One further note on using Durangos as drivetrain donors. Some of them, in some years, have key security. This means that it needs to read the chip inside of the key for it to run. With this in mind, you need to be careful if you want to use a Durango as your PCM donor. You can always go grab a computer out of a truck and use everything else from the Durango, and that'll be fine. If the key from your donor vehicle looks like that, it's got a chip in it and you're gonna have a bad time. If it looks like that, you're good to go. As far as I know, Ram pickups never had key security in this generation, so you shouldn't have to worry about it. Unfortunately, in 98, these gauges became digital, so there's no wire for a check engine light. So you can't have a check engine light unless you shove these gauges in your older vehicle, which I'm not into. Trade off there. There are ways to make it happen, but just assume you're not gonna have an engine light. Of course, you could go with an OBD-1 system. The computer looks like this, and the wiring kind of looks like this. I believe that one disconnects on the Ram truck with these three plugs instead of the one big one in the fuse panel. Otherwise, very similar setup. A lot of the wiring color codes in these are even the same, but in my experience, the OBD-2 is the way to go. For one thing, the earlier computers fail even more often than these ones do. They kind of run nicer, they idle nicer, they start nicer, and they make more power. Who doesn't want more power? So for these reasons, I'm gonna focus on the OBD2 setup. And I'm going to assume you're using a harness out of a Ram truck for simplicity. Be aware, it's basically the same for OBD1, and the color codes and the circuits that you need to work with 
are basically exactly the same no matter what Magnum vehicle you use as a donor. Here's another cool note. We're currently under the hood of a 2004 Jeep TJ with a 4 liter inline 6. But does that computer look familiar? It should. It's got the same Chrysler EFI system. Obviously it's only six cylinders. If you want to wire one of these, this guide will tell you how to do that. And on that note, this probably goes without saying, but the wiring for the V6 Magnum, also the same. There are two fewer injectors, but again, nearly identical. I don't know why you'd want to put a 39 V6 in anything. I mean, I have considered it myself over the years, but haven't gotten there yet. The wiring connectors on all of the sensors on the Magnum changed around 1997. I can never remember if it was for the 97 model year or after the 97 model year. Be aware that you need the wiring to match the setup you have. You can change all the sensors. You can change all the plugs, although I don't know why you'd ever do that. Or you can change the whole kegger and the distributor and the crank sensor to match the wiring that you've got. That's one of the really cool things about this swap. Essentially, all of the sensors are contained on the kegger here, as well as the injectors, obviously. You can pull this thing off as a unit. You can swap between them to get the different generation plugs or whatever you want to do. Isn't the V6 kegger so cute? It's also much lighter. This is a wiring diagram that I found on the internet. The thing I don't like about this is it doesn't tell us which year this is or which vehicle this is, and there are little variations. Again, for the most part, not super important. The things we need to make it run are all going to be the same, but it would be nice to have that detail. For reasons that really aren't worth explaining, it's two days later. Let's get into it. To start this wiring project, I cut that connector off of the donor harness. I stripped the coating back several inches, exposing the cut ends of all of the different wires. These are the wires we'll be talking about the wires that will attach to power sources, relays, and the like to make this all work. One could look at a diagram like this and immediately become scared and confused because there's so much stuff on it. Every single thing attached to the PCM is found on this diagram. I will add a link to this in the description of the video so you can view it for reference. Here's another handy graphic. It shows the three separate plugs for the PCM and it has all the connections listed by pin position. That can be really helpful. Generally, I try to use the color codes and keep that harness all together, but if you need to chase down one wire or you wanna know where it connects into the PCM, this is the place to look. I'll include a link for this as well. This must be a 97 diagram because it seems to have transmission control, but it also has separate lamps and a tachometer circuit, which would have gone away in 98. That's eh, not particularly important. All the circuits we're going to be looking at, again, will be the same. Just be aware it's probably not going to match your donor. Back to what I was doing, which is Xing out the things that really don't matter. We could ignore those wires entirely. Then we look at everything down here, other than these few things I've circled. That's all included in your engine harness, so you don't need to worry about any of that either. There's even more up here we don't have to worry about because the injectors and the coil are going to be wired as well. That's all included with that engine harness. As long as you left it all intact, you don't need to worry about that stuff. Just about everything you'll need to worry about to get the Magnum up and running is in this section of this particular diagram. There are two power feeds that are important, one from the battery and one from the key that is switched when you turn the ignition on and off. Just in case you're not aware, a two color wire listed like this means it will be primarily red with a white stripe. If you find a wire that's primarily white with a red stripe, that ain't it. All right, maybe this is still looking a little complicated. Let's step away from that and go to this. The important stuff, the basics to get the Magnum up and running. Look how few there are. Now again, this is assuming that you've got the engine wiring as it came out of the donor vehicle all in place connected and you just need to add the power to get it to work. The computer needs power from the battery, power from the key and ground. Again, at least on whatever vehicle this diagram is for, those wires are red white for the battery feed and light green black for the key trigger and the grounds are black and tan it's probably self-evident but those black and tan ground wires just need to go to a good ground you could ground them directly to the engine or directly to battery negative but there are all kinds of options for this in your donor vehicle those circuits came from fuses in the power distribution center you might consider adding an extra little fuse panel to house them there are different ways to handle that 
If you're swapping from an earlier injected engine, you can use the feeds that are already there. A common modification on a classic Chrysler vehicle when upgrading to like an MSD ignition or a similar system is to eliminate the ballast resistor and join the two ballast resistor wires together to create a feed that is both powered during regular key operation and during cranking. Generally, that's a blue wire and a brown wire. You simply remove them from the ballast resistor, which here is tiny, join them together and use that one new wire to feed whatever you want. For example, when I did this swap in my 66 charger, I added the world's cheapest five fuse holder and used that new wire from where the ballast resistor had been to power up three fuses. The first one was the PCM key power feed. For the battery feed, this is basically the PCM memory. I took a connection from battery positive and routed it to that same fuse panel. Don't mind this correction here. I actually used two key fuses and three battery fuses. Anyway, as you can see, we now have the two power feeds that the PCM needs, and they came right out of that fuse panel, and it was pretty easy to set up. The way you feed power to the PCM does not need to look just like this. There are many ways to accomplish that. This is just one idea. The next section is where things get a bit more complicated, but bear with me, it's not too hard to figure out. We need a couple of relays, two or three depending on your setup. The first one is called the auto shutdown. You can think of this as the main relay. It's what powers the ignition coil and the fuel injectors. Chrysler decided to call it an auto shutdown relay because it's what they would use to shut the engine down in case of like a rollover. If the engine dies, it's a fail safe. It turns power off to the injectors and the ignition. Going back to our wiring diagram, the auto shutdown relay is shown here. If you don't know what a relay is, it's basically a switch that turns on and off based on an electrical signal instead of you having to physically flip a switch. You can see here the coil side. These are the wires that control the relay and the connection side. This is where the switching happens. The relays we're dealing with here are standard four pin relays. They could be five pin relays, but the fifth pin wouldn't be doing anything. So we'll just assume they aren't. I've covered relays on video a couple times before, but I'll cover it again here. Basically, a relay is a high amperage switch that is controlled electronically. Instead of having to flip a toggle and have all of the power go from the battery to whatever accessory is connected to, you can use a toggle to turn on a relay. The relay handles the load. Using a relay, you can get bright lights. You can power fuel pumps. Any high amperage device in your car should probably be powered by a relay and not just a switch. So to perform these functions, it takes a high amperage battery feed in here and outputs it to a device here. 30 is always the power input. 87 is the output. The connections numbered 85 and 86 are the trigger connections. These are wired to the little coil inside. When that's energized, it pulls over a connection that bridges these two pins. 85 and 86 need power and ground. It doesn't matter which one is which. And it doesn't matter which one you use to trigger the relay. You can have power on this pin at all times and ground this one, that works. Or you can have ground on this pin at all times and put power to this one. Either of those things will trigger it. Relays are used in EFI systems to handle the heavy loads. You wouldn't want a 30 amp circuit going through your computer to directly power the fuel pump. That just seems like a bad idea. Instead, the computer uses that external switch to handle all the heavy lifting. Now this is not 100% true, but most relays in most EFI systems are ground triggered. That means there's always power going in on pin 85 or 86, and the ground side is what's used to turn the relay on and off. That is the case here with these main Magnum relays. Here is our main auto shutdown relay as shown on this electrical diagram. As you can see, there is power coming in on pin 85, from a fuse that's powered during key on operation only. And there's power coming in through a heavier 30 amp fuse on pin 30. That is the power source that will actually power the accessories, the fuel injectors and the coil. Triggering the relay takes very little power. So the trigger side is powered through a 10 amp fuse. Now, if you follow that explanation, you might think, why can't I just have battery power running to 85? Well, a couple reasons. And the first reason is in some cases, I've seen the other pin grounded out when the key is off, which would mean the relay is just powered on when the computer is asleep. You don't want that. Really, it just acts as an extra safety. 
in case anything else happens, you can turn the key off and that relay should no longer work. To make the ASD relay work, you need something like this. In my charger, I took that same key trigger wire that's turning on the PCM. I jumpered that to a second fuse and used that fuse to trigger the power side of the ASD relay. I used that battery power feed, jumped it to a couple extra fuses and used a 30 amp fuse for pin 30, funny enough, for the power feed side of the ASD relay. Pin 87 went out to the ASD circuits. That is the ignition coil and the fuel injectors. And that wire, which I forgot to label, is dark green and orange. There, that's better. And I also have pin 86 there, the ground trigger side of this relay. It goes to the PCM. That trigger wire is dark blue with a yellow stripe. Again, all of these wires in the factory application you robbed your drivetrain from came from the power distribution center. You're gonna find all of these wires in the big plug that went there if you're using the RAM setup. Well, that was easy enough to understand. So let's add a second one, the fuel pump relay. Basically all the same information applies. I've shown here a separate 30 amp fuse powering it, and I've jumpered the key trigger off of the ASD relay. There's no reason you would need to add another ignition fuse. The trigger wire for the fuel pump relay is brown with a white stripe. And again, that is a ground trigger for this relay. Power plus ground equals output. The output's here, the fuel pump. Now an important note, if you robbed a RAM harness, you are not going to have a fuel pump feed wire. It's not in the PCM harness. It was a separate wire that ran from the power distribution center back to the tank. You'll be adding that. The factory wire, according to this diagram, was dark green and black. You can make it whatever color you want. Now I do want to point out, you could, in theory, run power wires straight from the battery to your relays, and that would work just fine. But if you ever have a dead short, say in the fuel pump, fire will happen. That's what these fuses are here to prevent. As you're wiring this system, when you get the relays in place, you can actually test them by turning the key on. You should hear the relays click on and then off after a couple seconds. I did this many times as I was wiring my first swap. Feel free to pause the video here and take a good long look at this diagram. This really is all you need to make it run, except possibly the battery temperature sensor. More on that in a minute. As long as you have a fuel pump somewhere that's suitable. This is really a wiring guide for the Magnum, but I will take a moment to talk about the fuel pump. If you're converting a carbureted vehicle, this is going to be the biggest thing you need to change. You really want a 3 8 fuel line running front to rear, and you really want a fuel pump in the tank if that's at all possible. On the frame rail can work. I've tried it. I don't recommend it. If there's a tank with an in-tank pump for your application, or you can modify your tank to get the pump in there, you really want to do that. You also probably want an external fuel pressure regulator. The fuel pressure spec is 49 PSI plus or minus 5 PSI. This can vary a little bit. The Magnum doesn't seem to be super picky. In the factory fuel system, there's actually a separate module on the pump that is varying the pressure somewhat. You're probably not going to have that, and I wouldn't worry about it. Most of the Magnum engines use a returnless fuel setup. That means there is no regulator on the engine. That's why they use the separate module on the pump. Early Magnum engines used a return fuel system. That means there is a regulator and a return line on the fuel rails. This setup might work better for you. Those rails will fit right onto any Magnum engine, so you can go grab a set of those and set it up that way. The easiest way to accomplish this for our purposes is a separate regulator, which you probably want mounted under the hood with a return line running all the way back to the tank. That way you can reach it, you can adjust it, and those regulators can often be vacuum referenced. The vacuum reference is nice because it takes away extra fuel pressure when you don't need it. That can help keep your fuel trims in the realm of reasonability and help you save fuel. If in your Magnum Swap application, you're using the RE transmission, that's the electronically controlled automatic from 1997 to 01 and on. You need to add an extra relay to power that. Now, obviously, if you got through wiring these relays, which are now in focus, you can probably handle a third one. In my 66 charger magnet swap, I did use the RE transmission initially until it blew up. 
twice. And at first I didn't know I needed a transmission relay, but I figured it out pretty quick, you know, when the transmission just didn't work. There is no relay control wire shown on this diagram. I believe for the transmission relay, you simply need it to be key trigger, meaning you would ground out pin 86 and just have another key power wire going to 85. The output for the relay isn't on here either. In the harness from my 2001 Ram donor vehicle, that wire was plain red. Your mileage may vary on that one. There might even be another red wire. So you'll want to verify that it's going down to the transmission. But what it does is enters the transmission and powers all the solenoids. You definitely need it. I've championed this swap for years, and this is why. I mean, what do we got here? One, two, three, four, five, six wires plus the power feeds and some fuses. How much simpler could it be? I might have spoken too soon. As I understand in some of these vehicles, they won't want to run without the battery temperature sensor in place. And I think that's to try and prevent blowing up the battery in extreme cold situations. You're going to have to wire that in too. That's not going to be attached to your engine harness. It's attached to the vehicle. You might want to make sure you grab it from the donor. It doesn't really matter where it goes either. You can really think of it more like an ambient air temperature sensor, but in these vehicles, it's mounted in the battery tray underneath the battery. I believe you're going to need this to get it up and running, but that may not apply to all years, all vehicles. That might be totally wrong. It's just something I read. In any case, I have integrated these into every swap I've done. I should probably try running without one and see what happens. The pink yellow wire there goes to that battery temperature sensor. So you'll just be joining those wires. You can see the other side is black, light, blue. That is a voltage feed from the PCM. It's shared by many other sensors. In addition to the battery temperature sensor, there are other useful circuits that you might want or need for your swap. Brake trigger, for example. That's a white with pink stripe wire. It would go to the output side of your brake light switch and tell the computer that you're hitting the brakes. The Magnum doesn't necessarily need to know this, but it would like to. Vehicle speed sensor. Same thing there. I've actually logged thousands of miles in Magnum swap vehicles that do not have a working VSS, but it would be nice. I don't actually know specifically what the Magnum does with the VSS reading. I thought it might use it to enter fuel cut. It does that to save fuel when you're off of the throttle and coming to a stop, but it's actually able to do this without a working VSS. So I don't know what it does, but again, the Magnum would like to have it. The VSS feed wire itself is white and orange. Incidentally, if you're swapping into a vehicle that previously had a TBI engine, like my 91 van, you can just plug that in and you're done. If you want to integrate a VSS into any other swap, it's going to be a little more complicated than that. There is one that fits into the same position as the speedometer drive on an old 727 or an 833. There's also one that fits in that position and has a cable connection, so you can still have your old school mechanical speedometer. It gets a little complicated though. There are two wire and three wire sensors, and I don't necessarily have the time or even the knowledge to explain the differences between them and how they work. Be aware this is a possibility, but it might require some science. The upstream oxygen sensor is a pretty important part of the Magnum system. You can run without it, and it will use default fuel tables, and it might work okay. But you really want to add that. You don't need the downstream one, and in many of these systems, you won't even get a code if you leave it out. Ask me how I know. There will be oxygen sensor plugs in your engine harness. And you don't have to work too hard to figure that out. You need to weld a bung into your exhaust, or use a set of headers that already have one, screwing the oxygen sensor in and plugging it in, not a huge deal. One problem though, on this harness, it shows the oxygen sensor heaters as being dark green orange and fed from the ASD relay. On some harnesses, that is not the case, and there's actually a separate O2 heater relay. This was the case for the donor for my 91 van. I don't remember what that donor was, but I actually added a separate relay to power the O2 heaters. Without the heater working, the oxygen sensor doesn't read until it reaches temperature, which can take 30 to 60 seconds, and they'll wear out much faster. There were oxygen sensors that were not heated at all. GM used those, for example, but they don't have as long of a lifespan, and I don't think the readings are as good. You really need these heaters to keep your oxygen sensors happy. Diagnostic connector. If you're using an OBD2 swap, which I suggest you do, you have the ability to wire in a diagnostic connector. You'll want to cut that out from under the dash of the donor vehicle. There are a few wire connections on there. 
They're not too hard to figure out. And you can find a diagram for this too. On this diagram, the connections going to the DLC are dark green and pink slash dark blue. You'll need to add power and ground wires to make the DLC work. If your donor is newer than 97, like this diagram we're looking at, there are going to be CCD bus wires running to it as well. The CCD bus was Chrysler's first version of a computer network. It let multiple modules in these vehicles communicate. The CCD bus is the reason you won't find circuits for warning lights or the tachometer in 98 and newer vehicles, because all of that was handled over the bus. The gauges had a little computer. Everything had a computer. For simple diagnostic purposes, the CCD bus connections aren't even necessary, but be aware, they're there. Being an earlier vehicle, there is an EGR solenoid shown on here. The EGR went away, I believe in 98? Somewhere around there. A lot of changes came in 98. I also X'd out the purge solenoid for simplicity. You may need this if you have a vehicle that had one. Again, like a TBI-powered vehicle of the late 80s or early 90s. You might just want to make that work especially because you may legally be required to. I certainly wouldn't suggest that you bypass any important emissions equipment on your vehicle. I'm just trying to help you get one of these Magnum engines up and running. And that pretty much covers it. If you're afraid of wires and electrical gizmos, this might seem daunting, but I'm here to tell you, it's really not hard to make one of these engines run. There are other additional circuits on this O1 diagram, like, for example, air conditioning. I wouldn't be using any of that stuff. Fuel monitor. Nope, don't need that either. You can see the CCD bus wires I mentioned there. Just in general, be aware that there are going to be more wires that are probably unnecessary. There's a 100% chance you'll end up with a bunch of extra wires you just don't need. I mean, there's cruise control stuff in there that's not usable in these swaps. The emissions parts. You could go through and depin the harness and pare it down. Make it a lot nicer. Whatever you do, hopefully it ends up nicer than this. I really need to redo this. On the subject of paring down the wiring harness and Magnum EFI swaps in general, I want to turn you on to this, the Magnum EFI Swap Group on Facebook. This group was started by a friend of mine, on the internet anyway, Kerry Kinzer. He knows his stuff. Here's a quick look at all those extra wires I was talking about. That's actually a different Kerry. Figure that one out. And there's all kinds of other cool builds going on on here too. Of course, I'm on this group too, answering questions and such. In fact, I'm even a top contributor. Wow. Carrie also has a pinned post up with a lot of the same information I talked about in this video. So just a really great resource for doing these swaps. Check it out. So there you go. Your big Magnum swap wiring guide. I can't stress enough how simple and straightforward this engine is to wire and get running in another vehicle. It's inevitable that I forgot something but I think I touched on all of the really important stuff. As usual, I'll be in the comments if you have any questions, so feel free to ask. And look forward to the inevitable part two when I remember whatever it is I'm forgetting. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the comments.